Hello friends, my name is Katie. Welcome back to my channel, Life Between Words. I have to first apologize because I have just been the most absent on booktube that I think I've ever been. Having said that, it's been kind of a nice break for me. I really miss making videos. I just find that it's really, it's been really, really hard for me to find the time to film and edit. My boys, particularly my youngest, is extremely active and I don't know if you watched my last video. I don't even know if it was my last video. Two videos ago, but I tried to film the video with them present and it was a little bit chaotic and I know some people love that when they watch my videos and I love having my boys in the videos, I really do, but it was, it was craziness to try and film and then editing was just a lot. Anyway, I'm, I really am going to try to work it out. The other thing that's been occupying my time, for those of you who don't know, which you probably do if you follow me on Instagram, I've talked about it there, I announced it in my last video, but in case you haven't seen any of those posts or didn't watch my last announcement video, my really good friend Molly from Molly Reads and I are starting a podcast. We're calling it No Thanks for Booked and it's launching in June and preparing for that has taken up <laughs> a lot more time than I think I, 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 I guess I expected it to take a lot of time. We're having so much fun planning it, but it just, you know, when I have a spare moment, I'm pretty dedicated to doing things for that. What I didn't expect was that it would, you know, take, be at the expense of this channel, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm continue, I'm planning on still being part of YouTube just as much the booktube community, which I love. So many of my dear friends are part of this community and I don't want to say goodbye to that. But just expect that things are going to be a little slow here for a few months until Molly and I find our feet with the podcast. Anyway, now that that housekeeping is out of the way, let's talk about what I read in the month of April. I had an incredible reading month again. I don't know why. Well, I th I'm going to say that in March, middle grade March, really put me kind of on the upswing with my reading. It has slowed down a little bit in May, but I, then I am reading some pretty hefty books and one of them is a classic, so I haven't finished a book yet in May, but that's okay because I have been pretty ecstatic about what I've read over the past couple months. Once again, like almost all of these books I adored, and even the ones that I didn't love I still really liked and there are a couple rereads in here too so I will mention those when we come across them. To start out the month I read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo which I'm going to scoot over here a little. So I started out the month reading The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo which uh, was a buddy read. Actually a lot of these books were buddy reads this month which is great. Um, but I read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo with my good friend April from Getting Hugga With It. If you don't know April please go check out her channel. I love April so much. She is such a kindred spirit. I think I loved reading this book with April even more than I loved the book, and I really enjoyed the book, but I will say, well, first let me tell you what the book is about. So it's about Evelyn Hugo. You can probably guess that from the title. Evelyn is a movie star from the 50s, sort of a classic Hollywood bombshell along the lines of a Marilyn Monroe. Like, she had that sort of status of uh, sex appeal. At the end of her life, decides to do a tell-all to a, a reporter of her choosing. And in this interview, very long interview, she talks about the seven husbands that she's married to, along with the love of her life. Here's what I loved about the book. I loved how juicy it was. It was such a page turner. I have read one other book by Taylor Jenkins Reid, and the way she writes is just so compelling and edible. Like, it's just very edible writing. I also appreciated how strong Evelyn was. She was a very strong character in terms of knowing what she wanted and going out and getting it. Having said that, I didn't really like Evelyn all that much, and I'm not sure that we're really supposed to like Evelyn, which is why I was still able to kind of look past that a little bit. She is unlikable, and in fact, most of the characters in this book are pretty unlikable. I think the character that I loved the most was named Harry, Evelyn's best friend and one of her husbands, and um, he was fabulous. I loved Harry, but the rest of the characters just, they were all conniving and manipulative. I've heard a lot of people uh, say that they love this book because, because of the way Evelyn was portrayed. She's a really strong character and she, and she is manipulative in the same way that 
men are often manipulative and get away with it and are just seen as very uh, confident. But I don't care if you're a man or a woman. I just, I don't like seeing that in anyone. So I didn't really love the characters, but having said that, I really, really enjoyed the book. And actually, by the end of the book, when I turned the last page, I kind of was at peace with my not liking the characters because I feel like that was, that was really kind of, I'm not really sure you're meant to. And so I was okay with it in the end. I read two Ella Montgomery books this month, or this past month, and I loved them both so much. I cannot believe that I haven't read more Ella Montgomery for as huge a fan of Anne of Green Gables as I am, or as I claim to be. I had never really read anything else by Ella Montgomery other than The Blue Castle, which was one of my favorite books from last year. Highly recommend you go pick it up. But I highly recommend you pick these two books up as well. The first Ella Montgomery book that I finished this month was Emily of New Moon. This is the first in a trilogy. And this trilogy is almost as beloved as the Anne series, as Anne of Green Gables and the rest of the books in the series. Emily is a heroine that I feel like if you, when you're a kid, you either, whichever one you read first or whoever, whichever character you identify with more, that's the series that you're gonna love the best. Emily, the series, has a much darker tone than Anne. Anne is sort of perpetually optimistic and very cheerful and sunny, and Emily is not. Emily is, not, I wouldn't say she's brooding, but she's much less cheery, and her circumstances are also a lot more difficult. Whereas Anne comes from a very difficult background. She moves to a home that is very loving. Matthew and Marilla really build her up. Emily's orphaned, kind of like Anne, and ends up living with some extended family that while they are not abusive, they are also not particularly kind. She's just surviving under much different circumstances than Anne. However, the book is still wonderful and delightful and you still get that Ella Montgomery flavor. Prince Edward Island is still a character in the story just as much and it was just wonderful. I don't, I wouldn't say that I love this as much as Anne because I love Anne's optimism, but I still loved it and really, really looking forward to continuing on in the series. The other Ella Montgomery book that I read is called Jane of Lantern Hill. This is one of Ella Montgomery's standalone stories. She didn't write very many standalone books, but this was one of them. And the premise is so similar to almost all her other books, but once again, the flavor of every book that I've read so far is quite different from one another. Jane of Lantern Hill kind of reminded me of The Blue Castle by Ella Montgomery. Jane, kind of like Emily, lives with a very stifling family, especially her grandmother. Her grandmother really, really stifles Jane, and her mother, Jane's mother, is a complete pushover. Like. She has no backbone whatsoever, and so Jane has to learn how to survive under those circumstances. She ends up going and staying with her father over the summer. Her father and mother are estranged. Her father lives on Prince Edward Island, and she ends up falling in love with the island and falling in love with all the people there. And oh, I just absolutely loved this book so much. It was such a delight, such a treasure. I wish that I could say I had already read this because it was wonderful. Highly recommend. But what reminded me a little bit of The Blue Castle, The Blue Castle was written for adults, so in some ways Jane of Lantern Hill felt like The Blue Castle, but for children. I mean, obviously, adults enjoy it because I'm an adult and I enjoyed it. Um, but what reminded me of it was the stifling family and Jane sort of blossoming uh, despite that or and learning how to sort of stand up to her family that stifles her. I also reread The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society by Mary Ann Schaefer. Uh, it was finished by Mary Ann Schaefer's niece, Annie Barrows. This was a reread for me. I read it with a friend on Instagram, and I was really worried because this is one of my favorite books. I loved it. The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society when I read it for the first time years ago, and it had been many years, and so I was really afraid that I wasn't going to enjoy it as much. But I should never have feared because it was wonderful, just as delightful as I remember, just as heartwarming and a little bit romantic, but that's not really the point of the book and it's filled with eccentric, quirky characters and just a wonderful story and this is an apostolic book which means that it, it's written in letters and it's one of the only books I've ever read in that format that I've loved. I think it really works for this. Don't let that put you off. 
and it was just delightful. Some people feel this book is kind of twee, but it really works for me. While it doesn't glamorize World War II because basically this book is about uh, this, the island of Guernsey which was occupied by Germany during World War II and it's the people on Guernsey telling their story to this journalist who then becomes enthralled with this community and goes and stays there with them for a while and just kind of how their lives become enmeshed and and also telling about their occupation. It does not romanticize the occupation but it also doesn't you know, get down and dirty and dwell in the mud, if that makes sense. Like, you learn some hard things, but it never feels very heavy. And I really like that. I really like that about this book. That does not bother me, although I know that for some people it does feel kind of twee. Um, it does feel kind of a little too easy. But, like I said, it works for me. It was delightful and a treasure of a book, and I love it just as much as I did when I read it the first time. I also am rereading all of the Chronicles of Narnia. As you may remember if you watched my wrap up last month, I'm reading them in the original published order, which I prefer. Because of that, the second book in the series in the way I'm reading it is Prince Caspian. I read this with Kate Howe. A lot of people consider this to be the weakest book in the series, but I kind of loved it. Reba Jeep is one of my favorite characters. Love Reaper Cheap. In Prince Caspian, we follow the four Pevensey children who have returned to Narnia and are trying to restore the rightful king, Prince Caspian, to the throne. Just read the book. It's good. The series is wonderful. I get so much out of it every time I read it. I have also decided this year to reread the Little House books. So, I started with Little House in the Big Woods, which takes place in Pepin, Wisconsin, which is, you know, like an hour or two away from where I live. I visited there when I was little. I remember when I was little being so disappointed because the homestead that Laura and her family live on is no longer surrounded by forest. It's completely bare. Like, there's probably a few trees, but I don't even remember that. Like, I just remember being very disappointed that it wasn't exactly how it was in this book. I loved the writing in this book. I thought that it was wonderful. I remember learning that Laura wrote these books with a lot of help from her daughter Rose, so she didn't, she wasn't the only one who read them. She also puts very rose-colored glasses onto what was probably not even probably. Definitely a very, very difficult life. These books read very sweetly when in reality, of course, there was a lot of hardship. I mean, she makes the work that has to be done to keep their family fed and their house running, she makes it sound like a lot of fun. Like, you would want to partake in this and your life would just be so joyful when I think that the fact that there was so much work to be done was probably really, really, really hard. I mean, I love to sit on my butt and read, and there was no time for that back then. They were always working. This book, just forewarning, was written in the 1930s, and it is a product of its time. Like, there's a song that Pa sings at one point. This was, in this book, this was the only thing that really stuck out to me, but there was a song that Pa sang that was if not racist, very insensitive and stereotypical. I wouldn't even necessarily have a problem reading it to my children as long as I talk with them about about what, what we're reading and what is being said in the books. Although in this case, I would have no problem just skipping over that song because that was really the only moment in this book where I was like, eee! Now, having said that, I still loved it. I'm still so excited to read the rest of the books. The final book that I read this month was I'll Be Gone in the Dark by Michelle McNamara. This is a nonfiction book that has gotten a lot of attention this year, particularly in the last two weeks, because for those of you who aren't following in the news, the Golden State Killer was just caught. Now, I heard about this book like four months ago when it was first released, and it sounded amazing, got my hands on it. Michelle McNamara was a journalist, and she also ran a blog called The True Crime Diary, but she died tragically in the midst of writing this book, and so that was one of the reasons why I wanted to pick it up. And it just so happened that as I was reading the book, I was in like the final 25 pages of the book, and they caught the Golden State Killer, which was just totally surreal. It was very unsettling to read about, especially when I was alone at night. So I read this mostly during the day. One of the things that I really loved about the way Michelle told this story is that while she didn't shy away from telling you what happened to the victims of this terrible man. It also never felt like she went into so much detail that she was using the victim's stories inappropriately. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, she told that line very, very well, and I thought the writing in this book was brilliant. 
I've heard that the audiobook is not nearly as easy to follow. She does skip around a lot. And because this book was unfinished, it feels unfinished. But to me, that didn't take away from the book. I appreciate that they didn't try to fill in necessarily the gaps that Michelle left. Like, yes, they spliced in some, uh, some things that she had written for other articles and stuff, but they also, they didn't try to replicate her voice. Her voice is very unique. Her research assistant and another true crime writer who took over the telling of this book, um, the writing of this book, admit that you're not going to come across this kind of writing often in true crime in terms of just how good the writing was. Also, the other thing I really loved about this book was that it was as much about Michelle and her obsession and where that obsession came from and how it drove her as it was about this man that they were searching for. So for those of you who don't know, the Golden State Killer uh, went on a rampage in California during the 70s and 80s and obviously it progressed so he didn't he wasn't always a serial killer they connected crimes before he was a serial killer that were still awful if you can stomach this subject matter I highly recommend picking up this book but only if you feel like you're up to it I know that this is not a book for everyone but it's also very very good so if you feel compelled to pick it up I would also say go for it Those were all the books that I read in the month of April, so that was a great reading month for me. I hope that you're all having a wonderful beginning to May. Let me know what you're reading, let me know what your favorite books were from last month. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe below. Also, go check out um, the Instagram page, not only my Instagram page, but the Instagram page for No Thanks We're Booked, the podcast that Molly and I are starting. We're so excited for it, and I just want everyone of you to be excited for it as well. That's all, everyone. Have a great day. Have a great May. Whether or not it's cold or warm, it can still be beautiful, so I hope that it is where you are. I'm going to go sit outside and read. I'll talk to you later. Bye.